Good morning and welcome to this very special Gleaner Editors Forum on the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on Jamaican sport. Now, the Ministry of Health has reported 63 cases, 4 deaths and, very importantly, 9 recoveries to date. Um, folks, the world is changing and the sporting world for sure has been flipped on its head. Now, my name is Andre Lowe, I'm the sports editor here at the Gleaner. Beside me to my left, Rashid Parchment is the assistant sports editor. We do have a very small but brilliant panel for you guys um, this morning, and we will be discussing COVID-19 and its impact on the Jamaican sporting landscape. Now, to my immediate right, we have President of the Jamaica Olympic Association. He's also President of the Jamaica Paralympic Association. That's Christopher Samuda. Um, uh, beside him, to his right, we have um, the Rose, among us, you know, unapologetic Florence. Dr. Olivia Rose, she's a sports psychologist, and she's based at the University of Western Mona. Um, campus and beside her we have Mr. Ryan Darby, president of the United Racehorse Trainers Association. So a nice diverse group of individuals here. Um, I'm going to start straight off the bat with you Mr. Samuda. Now from your perspective you know as president of the Jamaica Olympic Association and the Jamaica Paralympic Association how is this situation affecting how has it affected and how will it continue to affect sports in Jamaica um, in, in, the, in the short to medium term? Well, certainly in looking at it, I think that we have to departmentalize the sectors. We have athletes, of course, and let us start with that. Um, certainly it has adversely affected the athletes, not only in terms of their training regime, but also in terms of their economic um, situation. Um, we are going to have to look quite seriously as we go forward. I think this is a blessing in disguise. It will ensure that we create a business model that will be able to insulate risks as we are experiencing now. But certainly the athletes, and I've gotten feedback from some of them, it has affected them um, economically. A majority of them are making the adjustment. Of course, we, they will need some of them. We need professional help where that is concerned. But we are talking in terms of managers as well for the respective athletes. They also are affected economically. Um, they are also affected in terms of their athletes' relationship because the athletes enjoy a very good relationship with their managers, a very close relationship, and they are going to have to walk through with them during this crisis. Then we have the agents, and then we have the businessmen who are associated with the industry, who are, of course, are experiencing adverse circumstances now. So it is a global effect that this thing has had. As I said, going forward, we are going to have to look at how we do business in the future to ensure that we insulate ourselves from these risks, to ensure that we have a business model, and not necessarily a sport model, because we have to have the business of sport first before we have the practice of sport. So we have to look at that model and ensure that going forward, um, we are able to absorb some of the losses, some of the damages. We will not be able to eliminate everything, but we'll be able to minimize. So um, I have always said, um, since I assumed office as president of the Olympic Association, that we need to place far greater emphasis on the business of sport and crafting a strategic business plan nationally that will not only be able to attract the capital to sustain it, but also we have to look at the infrastructure as well, as well as the commercialization and monetization of sport. And I'm pretty sure that you and your ad administration, as capable as you are, will be leading um, that charge. I'm going to get everybody who's involved in a little bit, but um, I want to talk to you as well yes. about the Paralympic movement, because in all this conversation, we hear a lot about the Olympics, yes. not many discourse around the para-athletes mm -hmm. and their efforts. How is the situation, or how has it affected that community? And of course, your um, ability to prepare the team properly for uh, the Paralympic Games. You also, know, we scheduled to Our para-athletes have demonstrated a metal and unconventional it's affecting them, but they have made that just spent already. And you will quite understand because they, every day they are faced with challenges, either societal, social, economic. So they are able to ride the waves quite skillfully. They have, of course, made that just spent already. The Paralympic Games mirrors, of course, the Olympic Games. And it is, in fact, the Olympic Committee, the IOC, that signs the major contract. So once a decision is taken by the IOC, then the IPC has to fall into place. There has been, of course, critical discussions between the two um, governing bodies. But from a local perspective, my athletes have not made that adjustment. We have, in fact, reworked their training regime based on the dates that now have been set and the qualification tournaments that we have been advised of. And they are making progress. Um, yes, it's a period of rest, but they are still ensuring that their bodies are conditioned 
And come September, they go straight back into the training regime. So they have made the adjustment pretty well. Um, do you personally feel that they have been overlooked somewhat in the, the whole conversation? Well, we, no, 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 not, not so at all. I had a conference with the president of the International Paralympic Committee, Andrew Parsons, who also is in close touch with um, President Bach. So there has been open lines of communication between the IOC and the IPC. Yes, of course, there are societal perspectives that make us start behind the blocks. But certainly in the last 10 years, particularly with the London 2012 Paralympic Games, that was a fillip for the movement. And the Paralympic movement globally has come into its own. What would you say is the relationship between the Paralympic Association here yeah. and the various ones across the Caribbean? And how differently are we doing things right now as opposed to what they are doing across the region? Mm -hmm. um, I think factually, we can say that Jamaica is the leading Paralympic committee in the Caribbean region. We have an organization, um, unhappily, it has not been functioning, that is the Caribbean Paralympic Committees, and we have plans to restart that. But certainly there is a very cordial relationship. We meet each other at Congresses. We collaborate, for instance, when we had a qualifying event um, in the last two, three years, we had some athletes coming from the Caribbean here to qualify for the Olympics and the World Championships, Paralympics and the World Championships. So there's a positive relationship, and we understand what it takes to not only inspire our para-athletes, but to ensure that beyond the shelf life of sport, they're able to take their rightful place in societies, societies and be able to function. So the relationship, intra-Caribbean, excellent, excellent. But we need to do a lot of work to ensure that the structure is in place to facilitate greater development. What would you consider uh, more better procedures to do? Yeah facilitate better work? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we have to have a functioning organization. Um, CANPIC, um, that is a Caribbean organization, is recognized um, by the America's Paralympic Committee as well as the IPC. We are not voting members as a bloc, but we are recognized um, as an association. We have to build the infrastructure. We have to get a working executive together. We have to access funds in order to sustain programs for the benefit of the Caribbean I um, Paralympic Committees. We have to look for talent administrators who are able to commit themselves to the business of sport and to ensure that the development of the Paralympic movement is across the Caribbean region and that we are able to unearth talent that can take it their rightful place on the international stage. Sponsorship is critical, absolutely critical, in order to sustain your programs and therefore we are going to have to shop for sponsors um, and ensure that whatever infrastructure is in place will be sustainable. All right, um, lest Mr. Samuda thinks we're picking on him, let's move across to Dr. Rose for, for a while. Um, Dr. Rose, a lot of focus has been placed on, you know, athletes, um, individuals maintaining, you know, physical discipline and their training um, regime and so forth. Do you believe that enough attention is being placed on how we prepare ourselves mentally for this situation? To an extent, uh, there has been, you know, enough emphasis on how athletes should be coping at this time. However, more emphasis needs to be placed on the different support providers in the sport industry, and these include a whole host of other stakeholders, which some, in some instances athletes would make up a part of that, but it also includes coaches, um, officials, sports administrators, every profession that would have sports in front of it, including sports psychologists, sports nutritionists, physiotherapists, all those sports journalists. How could I forget, right? <laughs> and we are all affected. Referees, we understand as well. And you know, we are all affected. And I don't know if sufficient preparation can be made because this is new to all of us. Not that pandemics are new, but how going through one at this point is new. So, you know, it's going to be somewhat of a trial and error initially, but um, I think with the necessary, um, following the necessary guidelines and um, different coping mechanisms that we all need to employ and that we all employ differently also, because we need to understand that our culture, cultural coping is different and what works in one particular culture, separate and apart from the instructions given by um, the World Health Organization and so on, culturally we cope differently and sports has its own nuances. I remember in an article recently by I think Dalton Myers, um, athletes don't work indoors. We don't necessarily work indoors. So, you know, some persons can make that adjustment smoother than others, and for some it's a bit challenging. Some would have attested to being bored, um, not knowing what to do with all this new free time 
and it ranges not just from athletes but coaches to um, sports administrators, sports journalists, and, and a whole gamut of other professionals in the in the industry. So I don't think we are sufficiently prepared for something like this because what would have happened is that you know a, a, a situation such as a pandemic lasts for a very long period. You know, normally we can get over um, chronic stress for or acute stress sorry in a, in a shorter period of time but what's happening now is a bit extended so this will tax our mental strength and our resilience will be in in question and you know it may affect people both positively and negatively you will have probably some athletes um rising out of this challenging situation in in, in positive light some will become um warriors to winners and the reverse can happen, you know. So it really depends on how able how they're able to cope individually and collectively and to know that we're all in this together. Right. Now clearly you are concerned about the ability of some athletes to cope mentally at this difficult period. Some may disagree with you and say that there are athletes who are mentally strong, so it doesn't affect them that much. But is it that there that one of the problems with sports psychology, psychology in Jamaica is that there are some who take a one-size-fits-all approach to it and that hampers the work you're trying to do. I'm very happy you mentioned that because during a pandemic, especially one of the COVID-19, who doesn't need a sports psychologist? I have been in touch also with my other sports psychologist colleagues from the different islands, you know, Barbados and Trinidad, to name a few. and. Our work now at this particular time has quadrupled because the needs vary right across the board from different um, stakeholders, different players in this industry. And if we look at how we perceive health culturally has some remnants of our colonial past because we don't want to engage in any form of activity or um, activity that would make us seem in need of help or that contradicts our um, identity of being resilient, of being strong, based on all of what we would have been through. And as a result, seeking mental and emotional help would fall under that category. However, to say a one-size-fits-all and that all athletes are, or most athletes are mentally strong um, is a very um, erroneous impression and we are all having difficulties in various ways because we need to remember too that many athletes have relatives who live overseas so it's not just the immediate person in front of you we have athletes who have families in areas that have high rates of the pandemic and high death rates as well so we and some of them provide um income to their families so we're all affected in, in various ways. So to say that, you know, you can cope because you, you are used to having a loss or you'd have to come back from a defeat in a, in a particular event is completely different from coping in an ex for an extended period during a pandemic. So we definitely cannot take the one size approach to how, this, um, how we are gonna cope through this season. And, um, and I will still continue to encourage um, persons to monitor their psychological health and um, check in as much as possible and I am still going to implore and ask for greater support in um, psychologists providing the kind of support that's needed to all the stakeholders in the sports industry but not just the sports industry. Um, currently we have the president of the Jamaica Psychological Society uh, and a group of 40 psychologists volunteering to provide psychological and emotional support for um, our frontline healthcare providers. And this is the kind of um, support that's very essential at this particular time. All right, I'm gonna bring, bring in Mr. Darby. And um, of course, mask at hand. And I, I just wanna pause to just thank everybody on the panel for, for being here um, in this climate to discuss what we know is a, a very important topic. Mr. Darby, of course, horse racing is considered the sport of kings, but the situation is threatening to make paupers out of many um, in the industry. Generally, how is the, the industry, its stakeholders, coping with the situation? 
I've never start off with the sport of king and paupers because we need to get rid of this sport of king mentality. Racing is operated by majority hard working people who are in an economical crisis at this point. Unlike, well, let us go abroad. The whole world is in a crisis, stock market, economic crisis. Unlike any other manufacturing plant, you can turn your brick off and you, 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 you send home your staff on three months, no pay leave. So you cut your, you cut your, your production um, expenditure by 90%. Our racing only get money by running. And with no race running, we have zero opportunity of earning. But the, the, the notion of sport of king came from because it's an expensive sport. But what you would have is that you should be earning some form of income and you'll be, and you'll, uh, um, put the rest if it needs to be. With zero income now, we're going to be in an economic crisis and we cannot cut the maintenance of the horses uh, much more. It's average at $18 million per week. $18 million per week to operate to keep the horses. Between the owner and the trainers, that's what it costs us. We have to bring it down into a maintenance mode just of survival and the minimum we could reach is $12 million. And that is minimum care per week with zero income. So we are we are we have uh, written to the, the minister. We have written to various uh, authorities, racing commission, and I can tell you it's minimum. The, the response has been minimum so far, and I, and I want to just have the same notion of sport of king or rich people sport. But we are desperately crying for help, and it's necessary for some intervention to take place now. Out of all the thing. I can safely say that Supreme uh, Feed is the one person that has offered some form of support. Mine are maybe not very great, but one support so far up to this point. But as I said, we are in an economic crisis. I remember racing affects the 14 parishes employment. There are a lot of things into racing as a business aspect of it. You know. We have OTB, 14 parishes across it. So, so the, the, the unemployment uh, will, will, will affect 14 parishes, not just uh, St. Catherine and Caymanas Park. So it's, it's bad time for everybody. I fear to say that you would have preferred a different approach to the complete closure of Caymanas Park. Uh, I think, I think uh, Supreme Ventures uh, uh, went uh, it closed a little bit too early. But at this present point, I think we need to watch uh, the spread of the, the thing because our life is going to be the ultimate uh, factor. So at this point, we're going to need to look at, at the, the rate of the spread, the, the, the risk factors, and all of that before we can even consider and open it back. But as I was saying, at 12 million a week with zero income, you still going to have the Prime Minister said, you are going to try and balance because after COVID, there will be life. Who's, al who's alive, that is? Uh, 12 million represents the entire horse population, right? Uh, at Cayman as far, we're not talking about the farms and mm -hmm. other the other entities. There's a reason why it's continuing to branch off as you go along. Uh, we, have, we have quite a few farms with millions of dollars of production, but we are talking about the plant itself. I, I know Rashid wants, wants to come in, but just, just one more question. Um, how long do you think the, the owners and trainers could sustain this, you know, this current spend? I'm sure we can't go much longer, you know. As I said, we are, uh, we are resilient. Uh, we will, I guess people will adjust and, 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 and hang on as long as possible. But as I said, at some point, uh, you will have uh, people falling on by the wayside. And there will be a lot of, a lot of fallouts and, and things. In, as I said, with the whole economic climate, you know. So we're going to expect that as well. So as I said, we'll go along and, and survive as long as possible. As I said, we don't need to stay alive that when this is done, we can rebuild. Now, um, are the grooms being considered in this in terms of preparing them for what may come? Because we still don't know what is how long we have to ride this out. Are there any welfare programs being discussed up to take care of the grooms? Uh, well, we we have been discussing. We have we have we have like one hundred meetings since the last uh, three weeks. So we have discussed every factor of racing run, uh, financial, um, the healthcare, the uh, workers' healthcare including grooms, the trainers, but at this point, the groom is, is least affected so far. Because I said, the RC need to be maintained, the RC need to be looked after. I said, they, they cannot leave them, you know. Yeah. So the operation has scaled down a bit, but it, 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 it still need 
grooms to angle them you still need uh, the, the feet operation, the grass, everything is the same. You just have to cut the exercise program, you might cut the feet a little bit because they don't need that, the amount of energy for, for that they need for racing. But there are that happen that we scale it down a little bit. But in the long term, uh, as I said, we'll be looking at the ways to, to how we'll, we'll move forward because it's going to be difficult to sustain uh, this amount of loss for a sustained uh, period of time. I'm glad you mentioned the horses because recently we heard of a tiger catching COVID-19 at the Bronx Zoo. So it means that COVID is not necessarily limited to just humans, but maybe other, other species other than humans and feline. But are there any plans, are there any measures in place to protect the horses at this time? Uh, not, not directly, not, not the off and that we have a plan. We are hoping that it not continues to horses. Uh, Belmont, I think Belmont Aqueduct, one of New York tracks, mm -hmm. but that had a lot of cases on the track. Uh, there wasn't any, any carryover from uh, person to horses so far. So we keep our fingers crossed that that will remain. But as I said, they, 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 we, are, we are doing everything we can with the resources that we have, but as I said, they, they are limited to what we could be able to do if, if, if it can be transferred to us more than a person as quarantine, which is what we are doing, trying to do now. Alright, Sir Samuda, this Olympic postponement, um, how is it affecting the GOA's covers? Mm -hmm. Minimal, minimal. Um, we have instituted a business model that um, will insulate us from risks, um, as any good organization would do. Um, we have our contractual obligations that we have to fulfill, but in contracting we ensure that in situations such as this we are able to release, be released from the contracts. The expense has been minimal, all right? So it has not really affected the GOA. What we simply have to do is to rewrite the script now, having regard to the fact that it has been postponed and new dates have been set. And we are currently doing so. We're in touch with our associations. We're in touch with those who are on the cusp of qualifying. We are in touch with the international federations, who are, of course, in collaboration with the IOC, will now establish the new um, days for the tournaments and so forth. And um, monies that were committed, we will um, 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 Commitments that were um, made, we will honor. And certainly going forward, um, once we are able to meet as a group, then we will do so and then unveil, of course, of the strategy that will, of course, redound to their benefit for next year. But the associations have indicated that they are keeping their athletes, keeping their managers well informed. A lot of information is coming out from the IOC and the IPC, and um, that is very good, because when you keep people informed, they get a sense of, of comfort and understanding. So the GOA happily has not been seriously affected at all by this. Um, do you think that the decision to postpone the Olympics, I mean, we all saw what was happening, um, in many parts of the world and so many things revolve around the Olympic Games itself. Do you believe that this is what came a little bit too late? And how would you respond mm -hmm. to criticism that the JOA, mm -hmm. being a, a major player in the Olympic movement, um, was a little too silent mm -hmm. in calling for that postponement a little earlier? No, absolutely. You have to look at the factors as they existed then. Um, when we were advised by the IOC in a teleconf teleconference with President Bach, he indicated that he is awaiting uncertain advice from the um, WHO and other professionals. Um, you can always look back and say you should have taken the decision one week, two weeks earlier. All right, But at the time, you have to base your position on the facts that are presented to you. The GOA certainly was not silent. We, in fact, indicated from the very get-go that we will rely on the professional advice of the experts. We will rely on the advice given by the IOC. Because if the IOC had taken the decision, although we may have said, look, we are not going to participate, it would have been a decision taken by them and some would have to fall in line. But certainly from a time factor, I don't think that we were off the mark at all. As a matter of fact, we said from the very get-go that a decision has to be made quickly. But what you need to do is to ensure that you have all the facts that govern the situation so that when you do make the decision, it will be informed and it will be a win-win situation for all. Um, when you are in the belly of the whale and you realize the risks that are involved, economic, social, and otherwise, and psychological, you are instinctively are not going to jump and make the decision, particularly if you are going to be relying, as I say, on the experts. And for that reason, yes, the IOC could have made the decision earlier, but I quite understand at the time what factors were in fact cons um, governing their decision. And therefore, I would not really hold them to say that you ought to. And as a result of that, 
there have been deleterious circumstances that have arisen. And then a quick one before Rashid gets in. Um, mm -hmm. I know you do have uh, a very wide region Olympic yes. Solidarity Fund. Yes. But is the JOA considering or mm -hmm. in a position to offer additional assistance to athletes who, of mm -hmm. course, uh, would find themselves in a position now with you know, a loss of revenue? Mm -hmm. um, one has to be very careful. We have helped athletes in the past, and we have, of course, offered through the Olympic Solidarity um, Movement scholarships that have assisted them. But we have to be very careful because although I've said repeatedly, Mr. Lowe, that we're not an ATM machine, but you can bank on us and we're bankable. But we're not an ATM machine. And therefore, we operate with a very limited budget, which is primarily devoted to the development of the sport and not necessarily an individual. So we have to be very careful from a policy point of view that we do not pursue that. And then a team sport is left without any funding to qualify for the Olympics. Um, so we have to strike a balance. We're not insensitive, of course, to the needs of our athletes, and we have, in fact, satisfied some of those needs. But we have, as policymakers, have to be very careful that we do not create precedents that come back to haunt us, and then people, of course, blame us for the indiscretion. Right. Just quickly, you mentioned uh, sponsorship earlier, and clubs and sporting associations seeking sponsorship. But there has been thought that after all this with the pandemic, we may be facing a global economic recession. Yes. What does that mean for the smaller sporting associations see, who already struggle to seek sponsorship and what it may mean, a recession may mean for them in getting more funding on board? It's going to be difficult and this is why I say um, that we have to look at something of a more permanent fix. What we have been saying to our associations, difficult as it may appear to be them, you have to become self-sufficient in the circumstances. We know that we will have to fund you and we will do so based on merit because we say our funding is based on meritocracy. We will do so, but any organization would want to know that in the next five years, um, assistance from the JOA would only occupy perhaps 25% of their budget because sport is becoming very expensive and the expenses outstripping the revenue that is coming in. And this is why we have to look in terms of a national sport business plan which, of course, as I indicate, would, have track, would attract the capital necessary in order to support the infrastructure and support um, athletes and support stakeholders in crises such as this. All right. Um, thank you, sir. Dr. Rose, um, for an athlete you know, fully invested in competing this year right, and putting all their efforts towards those targets, and we only have a few minutes left, but how... how from your you know, um, perspective and your expertise, how would you um, advise them you know, to get back to a place, you know, for, you know, I guess, refining or refocusing um, their targets? How difficult is that a challenge for them? This is a difficult challenge for athletes and just generally for all of us involved because the uh, lockdown has, and has posed mm -hmm. problems where you uh, can have marathons with your thoughts you know you are alone with your thoughts and possibly with yourself for some people and therefore the journey with the self-thought needs to really be positive and it's important even before we talk about being positive and hopeful that you are self-aware of your own coping mechanisms are you the over researcher are you the one that's panicking are you stuck in the fear zone are you growing through this? Are you innovating new ways to learn and to develop your craft? Because a huge concern for many of the athletes is that they may be losing their skill and their talents and so on. And that's a, that's a possibility because you know um, the, the, their preparation requires practice and improvement in order for them to, to master certain skills. However, during this time, we are more encouraged to use the moment to reflect we um, watch over some of the videos that you would have had based on your performance if they were good how can you repeat those if they were not so good what are the areas for improvement for all areas because even the officials can do some of this based on the the coverage that they would have had of some of the video clippings uh also have a routine you know do this is that don't the days go by real quickly i don't know if you are noticing uh, for those persons who are home, the, the days actually do go by and don't want to be unproductive. This is a time also that will test your mental fortitude because you will receive, and some, some athletes have been receiving their training programs from their physical trainers and coaches. 
the only thing is that they don't have their teammates um, around them to, to do it, or some of them do in terms of if they, if they are virtual training sessions, but others don't. And therefore, if you're given a program, it's going to require a lot of discipline to ensure that you do what is asked of you. Or there are some athletes who may not be as concerned either during this time because some of them are um, nursing injuries and uh, are using the time to heal and recuperate to come back again. So it's all it's, it's definitely going to be based on the particular cases and the how well they are able to withstand the times, keeping a positive attitude and monitoring their mental health, their um, having routines and staying socially connected while physically distancing themselves. Thank you, Dr. Rose. My final question, uh, and we're basically out of time. Um, Sir Darby, what kind of support would you like to see from the industry's top brass, you know, be it SVRL, or the government itself, or um, the JRC, BGLC? The financial support, because I said, uh, we're looking at the nearest possible time to reinstate racing. So we want to do it at the safest, closest possible time, and I guess that will be depend on the, the, the continued rise or fall of the virus. Uh, but at this point, we will need financial support to help sustain and carry us through that we can, that racing don't die. All right. Quickly, President and Dr. West, final word. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this is an opportunity for us to fix a lot of things. I think it's an opportunity, as I said, to look at the infrastructure and how it responds to crises of this nature. Are we ready? No, we're not ready. And therefore, it will take not only one, two, or three, but all stakeholders to come to the table and let us work out a national sport business plan, which will not only just look at the cost of the infrastructure, but also to look at what it takes to bring in sports psychologists so that they can be effective in this how the horse racing industry would respond, what are the reserve mechanisms that will be in place to support um, the industry when such a crisis as this um, occurs. It's an opportunity. Let us not waste it. Let us go to the table immediately. Dr. Lewis, 20 seconds. Yeah, I want to echo the sentiments of Mr. Samuda about this being the opportunity for us to really reevaluate how do we engage all stakeholders in sports and not just engaging but understand that we all play a different role and we're all affected we're all going through this together and a positive attitude along with understanding different idiosyncrasies will be uh, very important in taking us through and beyond all right thank you like i said a small panel but a brilliant panel um, I want to thank our production team I want to thank you guys for joining us um, thanks to the panelists for You're being welcome. here in this very challenging time I know it's a tough ask but again the discussions must continue um, guys please note that um, Television Jamaica they will be having their um, virtual sports town hall tonight at 8 30 and thank you very much for joining us it's just the first many more to come as we continue to discuss um, COVID-19 and its impact on the Jamaican sporting landscape. Thank you very much.